Okay, so I'm going to go through a lot of material tonight, so I'm going to go relatively quickly, but we will have a lot of time for questions, so definitely um, you know, keep those, those questions in mind. So we're going to talk about Silicon Valley Syndrome, and the first slide is going to talk about what is the definition of Silicon Valley Syndrome. So basically, it's all of the tech workers here in the Valley who are at their computers all day, you know, inactive and um, stressed out, not getting enough sleep, and having a poor diet. And there's a long list of um, health issues and complications that this leads to. And this is happening in young, uh, otherwise healthy individuals in their you know, 30s and 40s, and um, you know, much earlier than you would expect. So it's, it's a really, really major problem, and um, that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about more tonight. But there's actually a bigger issue um, in terms of the background for why Silicon Valley Syndrome is such a big problem. And that is because literally every single thing we do from the time we wake up until the time we go to sleep is completely different from the way we've evolved to live for millions of years. And it includes all of these elements here, like what we're eating, um, how much we're moving, you know, the stress in our life, um, amount of rest and also the connection uh, with each other. And it affects not just you know, Silicon Valley workers, but um, our children, our families, you know, people of, of all ages. And this is the concept known as evolutionary mismatch, which I'm going to explain a little more um, to you. So basically, we can trace back our uh, history as human beings about two million years. Our earliest ancestors uh, lived in Africa uh, between 2 to 2.5 million years ago. And for the past two million years, we've uh, essentially followed a um, hunter-gatherer lifestyle until about 10,000 years ago when agriculture first began and uh, there was uh, a shift to an agrarian lifestyle. And evolution has not really kept up with these, um, with these changes in our lifestyle and society because evolution happens over millions of years and it doesn't happen in um, you know, 100 years like the way that we've changed our uh, diet and lifestyle. So this is um, Dr. Daniel Lieberman from Harvard. He's an evolutionary biologist, and um, he's one of the big researchers in this evolutionary mismatch. And he has um, found that there's many conditions, you know, not just um, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, but also um, back pain, uh, poor vision, and foot problems that can be traced back to this idea of evolutionary mismatch. Um, myopia or um, poor vision, you know, needing glasses basically is an interesting um, epidemic and especially in young people, in children. So um, if you look back about a hundred years ago, only about 10% of kids actually wore glasses. But now in, you know, certain parts of the world it's uh, upwards of 70 to 80%. So in a hundred years, you know, the, our need for glasses has shifted a lot and we can talk more about that, but that's just one symptom of this evolutionary mismatch of how we're not really living the way that we're uh, evolved to live. So uh, what are some of the things that have changed over the years? So let's look at one example in our diet, and that is um, fiber intake. So um, if you look at a typical level of fiber when we were in the hunting-gathering lifestyle, and this is based on studies of populations now that follow this lifestyle, uh, it was in the range of 100 to 150 grams of um, fiber um, every day. And uh, this was, um, uh, you know, in wild plant foods and a variety of other, uh, you know, legumes and, and nuts. And then over the years, as um, um, agriculture took over, there was still, uh, there was a dramatic drop in fiber consumption, but on average, still about um, 35 grams. Um, can anybody guess what current average fiber intake is for the average American in the U.S.? Five to 10, that's what I heard. Yeah, so 15, 15 grams. So, so you can see in just in the last um, you know, few hundred generations, there's been a dramatic decline in the level of fiber in our diet. And this is just not at all what uh, we are evolved to deal with. And also our gut bacteria, which is an important topic, they thrive on this, uh, this fiber. So uh, when that's missing, you know, that leads to major changes in your gut microbiome, which affects um, all the different major functions in the body. So this is just one example, the, the drop in fiber intake. 
Another change in the, in the last um, you know, period of years is the decline in phytochemicals. So phytochemicals are basically um, compounds in fruits and vegetables. Uh, phyto means plant, so they're plant chemicals that are our primary defense against disease. You know, it's why fruits and vegetables are healthy. And our modern plants um, came from wild plants that were much higher in phytochemicals, but also wild plants were smaller and less sweet, and so therefore they didn't sell as much. Uh, and so, you know, with modern agriculture, our plants have been bred to be, you know, sweeter, uh, larger, uh, less fibrous, and more profitable, but um, we've lost a lot of these um, phytochemicals. But what, it, what really is the difference? You know, how much have we lost? So if we look at the difference between um, wild apples and our modern ginger gold apples, this is one of the um, top selling apples in the US. What would you guys guess is the um, difference in phytochemical between, say, 100 grams of each? Like, if we, obviously, we know the, the, the uh, wild apple has more, right? But what percent more would you guys think? Just shout out a number. 75%? No, it's higher than that. Higher than 50, higher than 75. 85, no. 300, higher than 300. Higher than 1,000. So it's uh, 47,500. <laughs> so that is the actual, that's the actual difference in a research study that's been, that's been proven. And so um, this is why, um, you know, if we tell somebody to just go eat more fruits and vegetables, I think it's a little more uh, complex than that and people need more direct guidance. Um, so we'll come back to the topic of phytochemicals, but um, there really is a pretty dramatic decline in our food supply. So one other aspect besides diet, of course, is, um, is physical activity. And um, studies that have looked at modern hunter-gatherer societies confirm that basically intense daily physical activity is just part of survival. You know, they don't think about exercise, but it's just uh, necessary for, um, you know, collecting food, seeking out shelter, um, hunting. And um, this is uh, so just the way that we evolved over you know, millions of years. And even 2,000 years ago, uh, Hippocrates said that if there's any deficiency in food or exercise, the body will fall sick. So it's been known for you know, many millennia that physical activity is really important. Now, before we go on, I want to take a little poll of the audience. So which of these three factors do you think is the best predictor of early death? Is it obesity, which is defined as a BMI greater than 30? Uh, being completely physical, physically inactive, or experiencing loneliness. So there is one right answer. Loneliness. Okay. Okay. S -s -s All right. How many people will say obesity? Okay. How many people say physical inactivity? Okay, about half. And how many people say loneliness? Okay. Loneliness is actually right. It's the most popular answer, but. Um, by far, um, loneliness is the best predictor of, um, of early death and the, the harm to health from isolation and loneliness is actually greater than the uh, amount from obesity and physical in inactivity, I mean, which are, of course, harmful, but uh, in terms of um, you know, what the research shows, this is the biggest factor. And why is that? It's because we evolved in small, uh, multi-age groups of about 20 to 30 members, and um, that um, was you know, an essential part of our, our daily life, that, that essential community. And when s studies have looked at these so-called blue zone societies, which are parts of the world that have exceptional longevity, where people live 10 years longer than on average, um, and these are all over the world, like in Okinawa, Japan, and um, parts of California, in Greece. So their diets are completely different because they're all over the world. But one thing that's in common with all of them is they really prioritize social connections. And often they're spending um, a few hours every single day in um, meaningful quality time with their family, friends, and neighbors. And that's one of the ideas behind why these societies are so, um, so long-lived. Um, and um, studies have shown that the rates of loneliness are at the highest levels, um, you know, worldwide. Also, the highest levels ever are rates of living alone. Um, so, especially among the elderly, in the uh, U.S., one in three people older than 65 live alone, and about uh, almost a half of those older than 85. And um, there are many benefits to living alone, you know, the independence and that kind of thing, but um, physical health may not be one of them. 
And you know, that's what the research is, uh, is showing more and more, and it just reflects that um, isolation that's becoming more of a, a widespread problem. So we know that if we're going to go back and live the way that we evolved to live, I think we all know what the basics are in terms of you know, diet and um, social connection, rest and movement. Um, I want to talk about one thing that's a barrier to achieving these goals because we want to have you know, practical solutions tonight. Um, so there's one thing which affects not just you know, stress levels, the amount of rest you get, movement, um, and also how connected you are, and that is um, technology. Now, um, if we look at the past hundred years, you know, you might say that um, people are um, overreacting, that it's not really a big deal. You know, hundred years ago, we used to read our newspapers and wait for our horse-drawn carriage, and then now we're reading our phones and waiting for our car. So is it really that big of a deal? And actually, just moving back ten years ago, I was really excited uh, when I first signed up for email, and uh, you know, remember that thrill of getting you've got mail, and then now we're overwhelmed with mail, and you know, when we actually get a letter, it's like a huge excitement, you know. Um, and as communication goes global, the means by which we connect to people, even those who are within walking distance, are making a digital migration, and conversation is changing and sometimes going away for good as the couple at the dinner table you know, shows. And we're so you know, connected to each other. Um, this is a, a guy who's asking, you know, where have you been? No email, you didn't text, you didn't update your status on Facebook, but did you not check Twitter? You know, this is how uh, people, uh, this is, uh, how people keep up to date. You know? When you're going to the bathroom, you have to tweet, of course. Yeah. <laughs> So every single minute, there's um, 400 hours of new video uploaded on YouTube. So in a single day, um, there's about 550,000 plus hours of new video that's on YouTube. And then um, about 4.7 billion pieces of content on Facebook. This was actually a couple years ago. So these numbers are um, just increasing you know, astronomically. Um, and this was a very interesting blogger who, um, who wrote about this digital overload, and he said, we absorb this content no longer by actively choosing, but we're guided by these interruptions on social media, and they're all cascading with individually tailored relevance. Do not flatter yourself into thinking that you have control over what you click on, because our uh, Silicon Valley's algorithms have discovered the perfect form of bait and no technology ever had this depth of knowledge of its consumers or greater capacity to tweak their synapses to keep them engaged. So this is one way that um, phones are different from newspapers. But how often do you think you, that you check your phone? Um, would you, how many times a day would you estimate that you, that you check your phone? You care it all the time, okay. So when they did a, a study and asked people, they estimated like 30 to 40 times. But when they actually measured, uh, it was about 85, 85 times. And uh, these were for you know, young adults, but still they were spending about five hours a day um, you know, on their phone. And um, they estimated they were checking between 30 to 40, but actually it was more than 80 times. And uh, in fact, especially for children and teenagers, overuse of media has been linked to um, anxiety, depression, and other issues. So it's especially a big problem for, uh, for young people. Um, Nicholas Carr wrote that we've never had a technology like a smartphone that sh so shapes the way our mind works, a technology that you carry around with you all day long and are constantly interacting with. And even television was different because it wasn't like people carried a TV in their pocket. So what are the solutions to uh, this digital overload? Well, um, we're going to hear from Dr. Sinha, who's going to talk about apps that can be beneficial for you. And then you know, periodically um, delete and purge apps from your phone. Uh, it'll help your phone to work faster and perform better as well. Um, so notifications, you know, this is one thing that um, is a simple trick that you can do to uh, just affect how much you're interacting with the phone. Because I know it's tempting to know when your latest post goes from 30, 35 likes to 40 likes, you know, on, on Facebook. But um, that's something that you know, it, is it really something that you need to check your phone for? Some people actually schedule times to check their personal email. So you might say, okay, I'm only gonna check at um, you know, noon and 5 p.m. and um, the rest of the time I'll you know, just do other things. Um, you can practice unplugging at least one day a week where you're not using your phone that often. 
And don't forget, people can also be spoken to in person. And um, occasionally, um, you can consider a long or digital detox of uh, a couple days or, um, you know, God forbid, even a week. So we're going to shift gears now and go into diet and talk about nutrition. So uh, if you wanted to really eat like the way your ancestors did, our ancestors did have um, primarily plant-based foods, um, such as leaves, tubers, roots, uh, fruits, and nuts. And um, they did uh, eat meat and fish whenever it was available, but um, that was not obviously every day, and uh, it was pretty hard to hunt and catch you know, such meat and fish. So essentially, a plant-based diet is what um, our ancestors ate. And this is what I've come up with in terms of what I call the Paleo-Vedic approach, um, which is based on the, uh, the Paleo diet, which I believe is a plant-based diet, and um, also should be customized for each person, and also a nutrient-dense diet. So we're going to talk about each of these components um, in a little more detail. And this is the um, expanded on in, in my book, but I'm just going to highlight some of the key points. So one question is, um, was paleo low carb? Because a lot of people think that paleo automatically is a low carb diet. But in fact, uh, originally, um, the consumption of starchy plants, it's been shown by anthropologists that for hundreds of thousands of years, um, tubers and uh, root vegetables were actually consumed by our ancestors uh, for the same reason that meat and fish were hard to catch, but these were much more widely available. And so the original paleo diet was not low carb, but in fact had um, good quality carbohydrates because the difference is you know, the processing of carbohydrates and having uh, whole foods and uh, un unprocessed carbs is what is important, not a low carb diet. And what about in terms of um, legumes? Well, that's another thing that a lot of people in the paleo community say, you know, eliminate and cut out legumes. But actually, the evidence suggests that our uh, ancestors did consume legumes. Um, several different ancestral populations from around the world had um, eaten different types of legumes. And the trick with legumes is that if you um, soak them before cooking, you can remove most of what are called anti-nutrients, which affect the um, digestibility of the legumes. And that's one of the reasons why um, they cause gut issues for a lot of people and why they're recommended to be cut out in, in paleo. But this is a simple trick to actually um, overcome that issue and still get the great nutritional benefit. So we talked about the, um, the, the drop in phytochemicals and um, you know, my, micronutrients over the years. So, um, the, so my strategy is basically um, you know, teaching people how to choose the most nutrient-dense fruits and vegetables, and also incorporate spices. So that's something that's um, forgotten, but spices are um, among the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet and a great source of phytochemicals and vitamins and minerals that I think are underutilized. Uh, and why are micronutrients impo uh, important? It's because studies have shown that more than 50% of Americans are actually deficient in some of the basic vitamins that uh, we need for our health, like vitamin A, B vitamins, um, zinc, calcium, et cetera. And um, same thing as well with phytochemicals. Um, you know, the studies show that the more you're getting in your diet, the less likely you are to get uh, even, you know, heart disease, obesity, cancer, all the diseases of modern civilization. So um, that's why these micronutrients, which are, um, you know, both vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals are so important. So we talked about how um, phytochemical levels have declined, um, but Americans are not that good at choosing the, the more nutritious options. And I'm not, not talking about fast food, I'm just talking about fruits and vegetables. Um, so the most popular fruits and vegetables in the U.S., like um, iceberg lettuce, uh, potatoes, 142 pounds per person per year, and um, half of that is in the form of French fries, which is why the, you know, the, the pro where the problem lies. Um, bananas and pears. So these are, um, there's nothing wrong with these foods, but they're among the most nutrient poor choices in their categories. So if you want to really maximize your um, phytochemical intake, um, I'm going to quickly go through a few practical tips that you can use. So the more brightly and intensely colored uh, a plant is, the more phytonutrients it contains, because every color is basically um, caused by a different phytochemical. So 
For example, red comes from lycopene and anthocyanins, um, orange comes from carotenoids, et cetera. So you don't have to know all those big names, you just have to you know, eat the rainbow and try to get as many different colors uh, every day you know, within your, um, your diet and on your, on your plate. Um, little tip about um, getting more phytochemicals out of your um, certain plants and vegetables. So with avocados, um, the, um, does anyone notice um, with the flesh of the avocado, is there one part of the flesh that's more dark than the rest? Which part is that? Near the skin, yeah. So, the, and so actually studies have shown that the part just below the skin is the highest in um, phytochemicals and antioxidants. It's actually double the, the rest of the avocado. And why is that? It's because um, phytochemicals are how the plant defends itself. So the skin and closest to the skin are where most of the phytochemicals are made and stored. So if you are um, eating, you know, it, it holds true for most fruits as well, like apples, pears, uh, et cetera. Um, the skin actually has the highest level of antioxidants, and the area right below the skin um, is second. So, um, so just scrape those avocados clean, you know, when you're, when you're peeling them, and that's a simple trick. Okay, with lettuce, we talked about iceberg lettuce. Um, you know, not the best option. It does have a lot of fiber, but um, does anyone know what kind of lettuce this is? Romaine, yeah, good. So romaine lettuce actually has uh, four times the phytochemicals of iceberg lettuce, so it's so much it's far superior. And then there's a simple trick called lettuce wounding, which doubles the phytonutrient content. And the way to do that is uh, when you buy a head of lettuce from the store and you bring it home um, and you, you know, open the leaves, just tear each leaf into two or three pieces and keep it in the fridge. The next day in 24 hours, the um, phytonutrient level will double. And that's called lettuce wounding, which was a term came up with that researchers came up with. Basically, the way that works is that um, the um, antioxidants and phytonutrients are how the plant defends itself. So when you tear up the lettuce, it um, thinks that it's under attack, and it produces these uh, phytochemicals that uh, then the next day you know you can consume and get the benefit of. So, so your lettuce is uh, um, it's alive still when you bring it home from the store. And then these are also better alternatives to iceberg lettuce. Um, arugula, radicchio, and loose leaf lettuce are all um, superior to iceberg lettuce. So, um, so in my book, I have an entire chapter just on this topic, how to get more nutrients out of every single fruit and vegetable, and how um, certain vegetables are better for you raw, certain vegetables are better for you cooked. So it's a big topic, but I just wanted to give you a few tips from, you know, from that. So moving along, um, I'm gonna talk about one other component which is customizing your, your diet because we know that uh, one size doesn't fit all in terms of nutrition, but people often need more guidance and that's where Ayurveda can be really helpful. So Ayurveda is derived from the word Ayu, which means life, and Veda meaning science, so literally the science of life. And it's um, one of the oldest systems of medicine and he places a huge emphasis on diet um, as stated by this proverb that when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use, but when diet is right, medicine is of no need. And why is it important to customize your diet? That's because even a healthy paleo diet can be harmful, and what are some of the ways that it could be harmful? Well, if you're eating too much raw food, or if you're eating the um, incorrect amount of carbs for your diet, to, I mean, too few or, or too many, or if you're eating a diet that's not good for your body type, according to Ayurveda, there can be some negative consequences. Because Ayurveda believes that every um, person is unique and has a unique body type, and uh, that therefore diet must be individualized. And Ayurveda provides some detailed practical guidance about exactly how to do that and how to customize a diet um, for yourself. So that's the, the piece about customizing the diet. So now we're gonna move on, um, just touch on a couple other points in closing. Uh, this is about physical activity and um, movement. So there is one type of exercise which is known as um, high intensity interval training, which seeks to mimic the way that our ancestors moved, which was uh, long periods of low intensity movement punctuated by bursts of intense activity, maybe uh, running from a predator or hunting or, or doing something in intense. And actually research has shown that this technique is 
uh, better in terms of your heart health and fitness compared to regular cardio and actually takes less time. And it also burns calories even after you work out in um, something called a, um, the post-exercise burn. But um, this is something that I um, uh, encourage you to you know, research further. And um, I have some sample workouts in my book as well, which, which talk about this. But um, this is a way to use some of the lessons of evolutionary medicine to improve your health and fitness. And we know that um, our ancestors were moving throughout the day, so prolonged sitting is one of the new um, health concerns that we're learning more and more about. This was a study of over 200,000 adults which found that sitting for more than 11 hours a day, which a lot of us do, was associated with a 40% greater risk of dying um, over, in, over just three years compared to sitting less than four hours a day, regardless of how much exercise people did. So if people were sitting all day and then you know, uh, went to the gym three times a week, every week, um, still they had this higher um, risk of, of dying. And uh, so basically the sitting time can, um, if you reduce that, independently of your exercise routine, just reducing how much you sit and moving more during the day can really uh, improve your, you know, your overall health and reduce your, your risk of dying. So what are some solutions to, to do that? Well. Um, as much as you can, be physically active. You can track your steps, take, take frequent breaks, um, use either a um, standing desk or a yoga ball where you're moving you know, a lot. Um, they even have treadmill desks now where you can uh, log some miles uh, you know, at work. Um, and there was a recent study which looked at fidgeting um, and showed that uh, any kind of movement when you're sitting, even just um, you know, tapping your feet uh, or some type of um, fidgeting uh, actually was shown to counteract some of the negative effects of sitting. So, um, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, with fidgeting or um, doing, of course, um, you know, one of these alternatives to reduce the sitting that you're doing uh, throughout the day. And finally, this is a huge piece, which I'm just going to briefly touch on, is the uh, effect of stress. And uh, um, the fight or flight response is basically what kept us alive when we lived in the you know, uh, jungle. And th our body has something called the sympathetic nervous system, which uh, you can think of as the gas pedal for the body. And it evolved to uh, keep us alive when used in the short term. But chronic um, stress when we're in this fight or flight for a long time because of uh, stress at work and uh, you know, in, in traffic and then in, you know, at home, et cetera, um, that's just not at all how this system was designed. But, and that leads to higher stress hormones, blood sugar, high blood uh, pressure, and also inflammation, which we know is the root cause of most modern diseases. So there's really huge health consequences from uh, uncontrolled stress. And so the solutions to that are really simple. Use uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the break that you have in your body. And mind-body techniques, such as any of the following, um, can be really helpful to just help your body reset, to get out of that chronic fight or flight state and get into more of the parasympathetic nervous system response where all of those negative effects we talked about before can actually be counteracted. So your body has a wisdom in it. It has this uh, built-in you know, um, break. And if you utilize the techniques actively, you can get all the, the benefits of these, um, you know, these responses in your body. So we come back to living the way that we evolved to live, um, you know, using all of the different basic uh, principles of ancient wisdom like diet and uh, moving every day, getting adequate rest, staying connected and managing stress. And in my specific approach, which I call the Paleovedic approach, um, I also recommend uh, um, a daily routine, which might include fasting. Um, Ayurveda is a very big on a morning routine as well, which is, uh, which is really important as well as detoxification, because um, the difference between today and you know, a million years ago is one thing is the presence of um, toxins in the environment that we're all exposed to. So I believe that um, daily and periodic detoxification is, is very important. And of course, we talked about the importance of spices and customizing your diet using Ayurveda. So um, for more info, and I have about um, 53 recipes in my book, um, 
provided by Sharon Meyer, who's one of our nutritionists at the Institute for Health and Healing. Um, so um, do check that out. And I want to close with a picture of my daughter, uh, Alicia. And um, just remember that eating should be fun. And this is something I learn from her every time she eats because she really uses all of her senses. Here she is eating a pomelo for the first time. And um, just, uh, you know, really, uh, um, and, you know, using all of your senses, smell, touch, taste, and experiencing food, um, really connecting with our food, I think, is, is very important. So um, with all of these principles, remember that uh, healthy uh, diet and lifestyle and eating should be fun. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>